So I've previously tried to do a video on several subjects and I've ended up crossing over too much. So I'm going to do short ones on each one. First one's going to be on Max Egan. Now Max Egan has been complaining that he is getting picked on about Nightcap on Minjimbal and what AB and Mark McMurtry and the others are doing. And basically to go away, leave him alone, he's got nothing to do with it. Wrong Max, you've got a lot to do with it. Shall we look at what you do have to do with it? First of all, at the beginning of April, you introduce Mark McMurtry and the OSTF. So you introduce the sovereignty principles. You let the um, people that are facing the fear of the COVID lockdown and everything now hear of how you can obtain this illusionary freedom. See this thing here where he's appearing in court? Mark McMurtry, I challenge you to actually produce a judgment in your favour. I have seen plenty where you have failed, but uh, contrary to your ad advertising where all these successes you have in the court, could you please provide just one link? And since asking for this evidence is always something that you turn around and say to people, well, all you had to do was ask. Even Sammy Boy said that. Max says that. You all say that. Well, all you had to do is ask, and we'll, we would have told you the truth. Well, could you give me a link to a judgment? Not a newspaper article about Julia Gillard and some other politician either. An actual judgment in the court. An actual document that you've lodged with the court. The one in England too. Let's start seeing a little bit of proof and evidence. That's on the OSTF that Max Egan introduced at the beginning of April. Now as I scroll through here, all the dramatic negative headline titles, all the grotesque negative thumbnail images, you know, look, this one's got a noose. This one's a big virus coming to get you. And look, they're going to jab you. Here's this, you know, <laughs> crazy doctor. And oh, look, he loves this one. The Joker mixed with, you know, what's his name? Um, Gates and a syringe gun. I mean, it's a grotesque image. It's just grotesque after grotesque. Oh, let's throw a valid issue in there. But let's get to the end of April anyway. Here we go. Sacred people, sacred land, a conversation with not going to say because you don't deserve a tribal name. You are a fake and I do not need to honour you with that name, so I'm not going to, Mark McMurtry. So at the end of April, at the beginning of April, we're introduced to Mark McMurtry and the OSTF and the sovereignty um, solutions. Yes, they've got all these solutions. Now at the end of April... We're going to bring it back in again. Richard Moat Nightcap Realty, email address and a phone number because they want you to buy in. And Max has gone to all this effort to talk with um, Mark McMurtry on the land because he's been getting heaps of emails from people about inquiring about how do they, you know, buy in or get into this wonder that um, Mark McMurtry mentioned, you know, at the beginning in the OSTF one. So Max has had a flood of emails and he can't answer the question. So now he's going to do a video and hope that it helps to answer a lot of the questions that people have. And now here are the people that you need to contact to buy into. And in this video, he does a nice little rendition of I trust them. Max Egan stated, I trust them. 
Now, Max turns around now and says, well, it's got nothing to do with me what's going on there. You know, go and talk to Adrian Brenock and Mark McMurtry because I've got nothing to do with it. I only did an interview with, with Mark once. It's like, oh, come on. You're underselling it. You did an interview. No, first you introduced the OSTF, dangled the sovereignty and freedom carrot. Then a few weeks later, you bring in, oh, look, well, you can buy into it. Wow, and it's only going to cost you 295000 but $10,000 discount if you can settle within 30 days. Now, in April, when Max Egan said, I trust them, you have to understand that the whole dreaded cheetah and all of the other, what is it, um, uh, what are their names, Rich and Sheree Nightcap are organising camera crews and the documentary and the major promo for release after they buy back the property at auction in June. So they're getting ready. So right now they're making initial public interest and inquiries and getting in people through Max Egan to pay in to the nightcap on Minjimbal. And what better way to do it than work on the fear that has been created around COVID and the lockdown. So that's just in April. And Max Egan saying, I trust them. Now we go all the way through to August. Hang on, where are we? Just look for the thumbnail that stands out and I've gone past it. <laughs> Sorry. There he is. And amongst all the... See that, oh, Bill Gates still with the syringe and the grotesque. Let's throw in the starving African kids too because yeah we've got to create as much drama in the thumbnail look down here we're all masked <laughs> but then look here this little guy here yeah the way he sits on this front porch at the crow house it actually looks like he's got these little um arms that come out with these little pinches and he because he's got to support that fat guard he's got to lean back and poke it out it's much like a pregnant woman can't sit forward because she's got too much there you got to sit back and poke it out and he does that a lot and it does make him look like he owns the place uh, but uh we know that he lives at three triple two so anyway, this is the third video that Max Egan has done that it is associated with sovereignty and obtaining native title or sovereign title um, and the nightcap on Minjimbal community and how this is going to offer solutions to people. You know, that you can live outside the matrix and still use the matrix if you want to because they've got it all solved. And as I said, Mark McMurtry, please show us all those court judgments where you had all that success so that you can show all these people. But then again, I suppose that's in the same place as the DA approval in fairyland. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we've got three videos that have been done by Max Egan. He says it's got nothing to do with him. And by this stage in August, uh, I'm pretty sure I've already made inquiries by this time, if not now in September, to Nightcap Realty as a potential investor to see what I would get from them. And in that, I was told that Max Egan is now a valuable uh, member of the nightcap on Minjimbal. And through that, it was discovered that he was gifted that membership. He didn't pay 285000 I mean, how could he? He's been a freeloader all his life. He's not one of these people that can turn around and say, you know what, I got everywhere that I've got today because I earned it. No, the only reason he's, he gets anywhere is because other people earn it and give it to him because he puts out videos and, well, clearly they think paying to hear the repeats is 
is worth it. Hey, that's why I got rid of Ozstar. All they ever did was r run repeats. I've seen it. I don't need to keep paying to watch repeats. <laughs> anyway, hang on. So, Max says that he's not involved. Here he is, involved. If you can actually see in the background there, that's Adrian Brennock. And over to the left here, he'll swing around and he'll start talking to Mark McMurtry. And at the end of this, he'll say, I don't know, I trust them. So he's brought forward all these legal problems and said, you know, that, oh, well, that wasn't even to do with this property. And Mark McMurtry says, well, uh, uh, yes, some of them were. <laughs> some of them were. Let me tell you that the only omission from the active marketing side of it is actually Mark Darwin. Other than that, it's all the same people. Because little and unbeknownst to the investors of the Bulla Bulla community, Adrian Brannock and Mark McMurtry, Derek Zillman, Phil Dixon and Cherie Stokes were all involved right from before even they were involved as investors. So the fact that they say, well, it's it's some of the same people. The only reason that Mark Darwin's not in there is because during the liquidation hearings for Wollumbin Horizons that this little man AB here in the background, we've heard his vox say about how he deliberately did it, you know, and, and what he's going to do with regards to Wollumbin Horizons. And finally, it's been sold back to themselves, NCV and this guy here, illegally phoenixed. It was only hearsay and intent before, but now it's actually a crime and an act. So, yeah, they can't undo that one. Money's exchanged hands, contracts have been signed. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. In this video, Max clearly states that... Max clearly states that... All the uh, negative press has been addressed and that he has been flooded with email inquiries because of the one that he did at the beginning of the month with Mark McMurtry and the OSTF and mentioning Nightcap. Of course, he's been flooded with inquiries. So the whole purpose of this video is to try and bring clarity to all the questions that people have raised and the queries that they've raised around the legal actions and the actions of the developers in the project. And through that, we hear Mark McMurtry talk about how that any evidence against them has been removed from Google search engines according to the rulings of the court. Now it's also this video too that Mark McMurtry talks about um, plans that they've got in mind but they're not going to divulge them too much. That uh, got me curious as well. But ultimately this video here, Max Egan's gone to the property there's clearly Adrian Brennock and Mark McMurtry there and he's talking to them about the issues because he wants to do this video to allay people's fears in the place. All the people that have been flooding him with emails. Those people that then went on to have their fears um, reassured that there's nothing wrong because Max Egan says I trust them. You trust this guy in the background that's a bankrupt and he threw Wollumbin Horizons into a fire sale, liquidated the company. And even the judgments of the court last year to do with that liquidation were very damning against the legitimacy of any of the actions of the developers. And that will be something for another video because 
Yeah, you really do need to start reading the judgments these guys talk about. Because when you start reading them, you realise that what comes out of their mouth and what are written in the documents, in the judgments, are two different things. They can twist it to the way that they are describing it. It's like it's beyond me how any body can think that another reasonable thinking human being is going to believe this bullshit but they're actually not appealing to reasonable thinking human beings they're actually appealing to the gullible and I'm sorry to be so blunt but if you're not the sharpest tool in the shed they're going to sharpen themselves on you you're going to lose your money and you're going to be sold on promises that are never going to be fulfilled no one can build on this land no one. Even the tribal people that have been offered housing because you're as homeless as what everybody else is, you know, that they can't build there. Nobody can. It doesn't matter what colour, creed or religion you are. You cannot build there, okay? It's reached its limit. They're not going to put any more on it. And the thing is, if it's sacred land to you, why would you? Why would you even encourage this development where it's just going to turn it into another version of rural suburbia? Is this the way you treat sacred land? And on the subject of the tribes and Mark McMurtry and OSTF, consider carefully what you may have signed with him. Because if you have signed a document that gives him some kind of power or attorney over representing you in some way, you may actually find that you have no legitimate say because you gave it all to him to represent through him. This is what a power of attorney does. It divulges you of the power and gives it to somebody else. And I think that anyone that has had any dealings with the OSTF, that you need to have a look at anything that you have signed with them to see whether there is any kind of power of attorney uh, that you have signed away your rights to speak or to act in your own self or even on behalf of your own tribe because you gave that right to Mark McMurtry or Robbie Cole, um, Robbie Mills or David Cole from the OSTF. Did you give away your actual rights? So I'm going to get back on subject here. Is that Max Egan's support for this NICAP on Minjimbal development in April 2020? was actually to provide himself with the benefit that was confirmed via the email from Richard Mote where he was gifted a share for bringing in all those people. Now you go to Nightcap on Minjimbal's website and you will also see that Max Egan is listed there as a sales lead. So he's continuing to benefit and I dare say the aim of that is that any share that he earns on top of that is actually going to be able to be sold to other people and redeemed as cash, which will then filter through the foundation that he set up, like Mark Darwin showed him to set up, which isn't a legitimate NGO, non-profit organisation, but a, just a bloody tax dodge. And he'll put that money in there because the tax office never knew to go looking for that kind of a setup and organization well, foundation that was put together in the first place. Mark Darwin uh, back in 2013 said he had set up some over 300 foundations in the same way and how you can use them all for different reasons. Now, I know me bringing up this fact isn't a very um, good thing for some people that have actually said, well, this isn't aiding our situation, which is completely not associated with these people. 
but if they have actually followed the same kind of foundation status as what Mark Darwin has done for over 300 people, they should actually seriously be looking at the legitimacy of how long it can survive scrutiny if discovered. And that's the thing that Mark Darwin... Oh, you bugger. Oh, sorry about that. Some things, yeah. <laughs> Not scripted. I've already started enough times today and I'm determined to finish this. So we'll go back to the very first video that Max did with Mark McMurtry on the porch outside. Um, this is the main house, the crow house is out the back. Now, interestingly, when I first listened to this and came across this, I wasn't as well associated with the NICAP or Minjimble members. So right uh, just here is where Max starts to tell the story about how a white-skinned man is going to be the saviour of the tribes and how they all think that it's Mark McMurtry. <laughs> okay, now I made a few assumptions, guesses, based on the comfortableness of these two sitting on the front porch of the main house of where the crow house is. And like all things, I mean... The thing is that I look at Max Egan as he's an alcoholic, um, he's a recovering one. He's not currently drinking, he's got so many hours, days under his belt of soberness. On the other hand, I see Mark McMurtry as being an alcoholic that is very much active. And you can see that from his bloody gut. I mean, that just keeps getting bigger and bigger. And uh, But anyway... So the concept of these two, I mean, if you've got an active alcoholic and a sober alcoholic living together, that's not going to work. So that's not a long-term living relationship that's going to last. And Max has had a fairly good long-term living relationship with the person that actually owns 748. So uh, it's not Mark McMurtry and I was to find out later on that Mark McMurtry is you know pretty much set himself up as king of the tribes at 3222 Kyogle Road in New South Wales so you know that's where he lives that's his his castle and this place here belongs to somebody else somebody that both Max Egan and Mike Mark McMurtry know very well. If not, um, Dave Onigs shows up to do an interview. He's not doing it on the front porch because he doesn't know the owner and he's not good mates with him. So he just gets to sit out on that other little building part with Max. He's not privileged and known by the owner like uh, Mark McMurtry is. Now, one thing I discovered when I listened to this was that there are two more people on this veranda that I didn't recognise until I knew who the Nightcap on Minjimble members were. <laughs> There's a part in here where uh, AB talks, Adrian Brennock talks, and it's to coach Max on what to say and Mark McMurtry saying, yeah, we need to pat it out. It's like, oh, no wonder it feels like it's so long-winded because you deliberately pad it out. They actually say it. You need to listen to it because he does actually say it. And you can hear AB talking from behind the camera, telling them, you know, what to talk about and how to say it. So Adrian Brannock is most definitely on this veranda with them. And another person that's most definitely on the veranda with them too is Richard Moat. A person that Max Egan claims he doesn't know very well. And when it was pointed out, because first of all, Max Egan tried to deny that he was a member of Nightcap. And then I said, oh, well, Richard Moat said that you are a valuable member. And then he turned around and he said, I don't even know who Richard Moat is. 
then I sent him a picture of him and Richard Moat in the same picture together and he goes oh yes I remember him now <laughs> yeah you never forgot him it's just the story isn't it Max because uh, Richard Moat is also identifiable in here very you need to be listening very carefully but he actually laughs and believe it or not people actually laugh uniquely too you will distinctly hear that it is Richard Moat <laughs> anyway so that's four boys on this veranda doing this very first promo to set it up with OSTF sovereignty and offer a solution in COVID times very carefully manipulated and done to capitalize on the fear in people so that's the 6th of April by the 27th of April Max has been flooded with emails and now they're doing this backup video to answer all the questions of all the interested parties and this is again Max Egan why you are responsible for your actions this is your second video and you will do a third to drive home the fact of selling off shares in NICAP on Minjimbal for every person that buys in and mentions that they heard about NICAP on Minjimbal through Max Egan he's going to get a sales lead and he's going to get credited towards another share again how many of these shares can you actually give away you're going to give away all these shares to the tribes to build houses on that you can't build nobody can build on well the thing is that the judgment that was made last year when they were determining over Wollumbin Horizons and the liquidation of that company it was actually determined that the only thing that Wollumbin Horizons traded in was shares it had no other business it wasn't even established for the business of conducting the affairs of the members of the community its pure business was to sell shares <laughs> and that seems to have not changed at all and really do need to look at that judgment and I will introduce it because the judge has laid a lot of found work for uh, criminal allegations to be made against the developers in the judgment he made and the statements that he made that were in essence unrelated to the liquidation of Wollumbin Horizons but highly pertinent to the developers and their actions that ended up putting Wollumbin Horizons into liquidation like it is the developers always blame it on to Gillian Norman and a few of her however he refers to them that it's all their fault the judge made it quite clear that the fall of Wollumbin Horizons was solely due to the people that mismanaged it that did absolutely nothing right according to their obligations under law and if it had been presented to the judge that there were other charges to go allegations that he could answer to the legitimacy of their actions he would have been able to make a judgment which probably did include um, criminal actions that are being held accountable for but you see the thing was it was purely to do with the ability of the liquidator to determine the interests of people in Wollumbin Horizons not whether the developers had criminal activity involved in it but as I said the judge certainly did lay the foundations for that to come out in the future he, he makes statements himself very clearly that it is everything they've done is wrong is incompetent and he even accused Adrian Brennock of perhaps doing something deliberately to mislead the court 
not a mistake, but deliberately. So there's very, very damning um, statements made by the judge in um, not only that judgment, but other judgments as well. And these are the judgments that they actually claim were in their favour. Um, they're not always as they appear to be, as they tell them to be. You need to read the judgments. And this one that I read is 83 pages long. It contains so much talk about the trust, the shares, the uh, how there was a deed issued, not a deed issued. Um, the confusion for the judge wasn't over who paid what, but what kind of a trust the company was supposed to represent according to what they promised to all the investors. Because they never actually established that trust deed, the judge needed to make that determination. And he actually looked at several different, different possibilities and how all the people that bought in at different stages could be looked at simply by the definition of the trust. And in reading that, I mean, it, it's pretty boring, but you also realise that anyone that bought in prior to the 18th of September, um, November, when settlement was made on the property, has a different position in the shares as to those now that might buy in after it's been purchased. There may be a mortgage that needs to be paid out and those that are paying in will go to pay out the mortgage. Then, once the mortgage is paid, anyone buying in will go to improvements to the community. And the judge found this a very interesting point of distinction, that even though everybody had the same expectation of equality, no matter where, when, or how they bought in, the law didn't see it that way because there was no trust deed established to say that's the way it was done. And if there is nothing established now to say how it's done, well, Nightcap Village or NCV Enterprises is the one in charge now, not Wollumbin Horizons. So if things get too hot, that can go into a fire sale too. And anyone that's invested under the night or the NCV Enterprises um, part of it could end up just like the ones under the Wollumbin Horizons part of it. Because you are promised this deed document. You are promised to get it in writing and confirmed in writing for so long and it never happens. And when it does end up in court, the court has to make the decision on how to look at it. And when you, you buy in is actually considerate as to what value you can get back out of the company if it's thrown into liquidation, like Wollumbin Horizons. If you bought in and were part of those that your money was used to buy the land with, the court looks at you differently than if you bought in after it's been purchased and your money goes to pay off the mortgage. Or you buy in after all that and anything you've paid in goes for improvements. The court looks at all of that in different ways and your entitlement to anything back in the interest of the land and what you paid in accordingly is according to when the sale of the land process was in. I can see it all happening again. I can see NCV Enterprises could be the next in liquidation. I could see that the ones currently bought in before it was bought, the ones that may be buying in to pay off the mortgage, and the ones all that's paid off, how the court actually gets to look at, at 
that in a legal perspective and your legal position in that and your ability to get anything back out of that if you have not clearly identified that before you buy in. You don't buy in and then wait and say, oh, look, I trust you. No, if they cannot produce as a valid exchange your money for uh, your valid and legitimate document or share or trust deed, do not hand over your money. Not even a deposit. They need to prove that these documents exist and they're validly registered because an invalid, an illegal, an ill, an invalidly registered trust deed is just as non-existent as one that hasn't been lodged at all. So you need to look very carefully before you exchange money. Do you have something in exchange for that money? Because if they're only selling shares, when you hand over your money, you need legal proof in a document that you have legal entitlement to a share and clearly identifying what that share entitlement is. And as the court notes, if something goes wrong, what happens if something goes wrong? There always needs to be an out described in it if it fails because it is the understanding that these trust deeds are not everlasting, that they can have an expiry date and the intention behind their creation can fail. So you need to have in there a way to deal with things if it fails, like it did in the case of Wollumbin Horizons. Now I wasn't going to explain that and make it a really long video, but it is one of the important things that you need to start getting inside their heads, the way they think, the way they use everything and manipulate it so others will think that, look, we've done nothing wrong. Mark McMurtry will tell you that, well, yeah, they, that they sort of were the same developers over there, but even though over there is actually 3222, what they are actually now on is Peter Van Leishout's land that they conned him into signing a contract to be able to use. So when he points over there in the video, he's actually referring to 3222 and saying that, yeah, well, they sort of were the same developers. Yeah, except for Mark Darwin, who is still involved anyway, who they use Mark Darwin to pretty much blame everything on. In the judgment you can see from the liquidator of Wollumbin Horizons, they pretty much blamed Mark Darwin for everything. Even though Adrian Brannock and others got a little bit of a mention in there and criticised just as much with Mark Darwin, it was clear that the liquidator presented everything to make Mark Darwin the big bad guy instead of poor little AB who was a bankrupt. We don't want to draw attention to AB in court, do we, and say, well, look, he's a bankrupt. But even back then, in 2019, when this was actually being presented to the court, did anyone present to the court that the person that actually put Wollumbin Horizons into liquidation is actually now a bankrupt and the court should actually look at the whole proceedings in a different manner because of the deliberate manner it may have been set up in? Did anyone even raise that issue about his bankruptcy? Well, the thing is, if you didn't know how important it was that he not be conducting the activities that he is now, if you didn't have that experience to know that, like I've worked with uh, bankruptcies, I know this, once you become a bankrupt, you can't do anything. If you wanted to have a store card for over a certain amount of money, you'd have to go and get permission to do it. You need permission from your trustee to do anything. I've never been bankrupt. I just know what's expected of them. And the law lays it down very clearly anyway. You become automatically disqualified from conducting any kind of um, 
dealings and associations with companies and businesses when you become a bankrupt. You can't manage your own affairs, you certainly cannot manage the affairs of others. So you're banned from that activity. So the fact that it was never presented to the court in the context that well, London Horizons has still got only one shareholder, and that is Adrian Brennock. He's a bankrupt. Did the judge know? I'm sure the judge didn't know in 2019 when he made this decision, this judgment, that one of them involved was actually now bankrupt and that he had all these other court issues where he tried on sovereignty claims and his behaviour was less than honest. But again, it may not have made any difference to the court because the only issue before the court was the liquidation of the company, not the activities of the people behind it. That actually has to come in criminal action or other action separate to that. Because when you're liquidating a company, it's like they say in so many things that um, a company is a dead entity. No, it's not. The only reason that companies, entities exist with a registration number, like we've got a CRN number and a birth certificate number and all many, all these other numbers, is to identify us as a real, living, accountable, legal entity. That entity can be represented by a human being or it can be represented by a company. But it has to be a living, existing entity. And if they, it is a dead company, it's like a dead person. You can't sue a dead person. Likewise, you can't conduct business with a dead company. A dead company is a deregistered company. That's the equivalent of it dying. It was a living entity, it was legally accountable, now it's dead, it can't be touched, it doesn't exist. And that's why the liquidator was asked how does he intend to pay deregistered companies that are in essence dead now. They were living, you could pay the living. You can pay a living entity but you cannot pay a dead entity. You can only pay the estate trustee. And, yes, is there an estate trustee for the deregistered companies that are claiming money back off for Lumben Horizons as creditors? So when they say companies are dead entities and that your birth certificate makes you a dead entity, that is a load of crap. The only thing it does is make you a legally identifiable entity. That's it. Entity. And it, an entity is a company, a human being, whatever um, entity. <laughs> it could be an animal too. <laughs> They've got rights. Anyway, I think I've yacked for long enough. <laughs> I'll catch you next time.